They don't know. Blah, blah, blah. I, I know. <laughs> but here, it's not here we have a sun. Is it hooked to a rope at the North Pole? What is causing the sun to go in an angle? Yeah. We know gravitational things do that now, causing the Earth to go in an orbit around the sun because of the gravitational rope, for lack yeah, of a better but word. But there's no gravity on the flat Earth model. No, gra no such thing as gravity. No. Just inertia. Uh, I don't know. Uh, We're moving density forward. or electromagnetism, which we've already explained earlier. That just okay. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, uh, though I don't mind hurting people's feelings. Obviously, the Earth is round; it yeah. spins; it goes around the sun. And you guys, in the last two or three years, are coming up with this flat Earth model. I appreciate your zeal, but it's Romans ten one. You have a zeal; it's not according to knowledge. You're making a fool of yourself and of your fellow Christians. Do not include Kent Hovind in your flat earth proponents. Parts of the earth are flat. We tried to make our driveway flat so we could park cars on it. We didn't quite succeed. I don't <laughs> think anybody completely succeeds. We did the best we could. But do not include me in the geocentric or the flat earth society. I am not a member. Yeah. So looking back at I know, he says, I know, I know how it works, I know what holds the earth and the sun in place. Okay, I'm sure the majority of you are already familiar with uh, the series of videos that Kent Hovind put out, claiming to debunk the flat earth once and for all, and I'm going to do my very best to resist the urge to get into, get into uh, petty attacks on so many things that we could just get sucked into and and just the the rather insulting fact that he didn't even bother to research or debunk anything himself but just had an intern come in and claim to have researched it by watching a mishmash of videos on youtube and present a bunch of straw man arguments and so on but that's not my aim here at all and i simply just wanted to to feature this particular clip because i think it just profoundly exemplifies something that I think is a really important underlying aspect of this whole interesting, frustrating interplay between, you know, this Flat Earth movement and Kent Hovind basically being bombarded with it ever since he got out of prison and this whole, this whole thing. And, um, it, and right here in this clip, it just, it really says it all from where I stand. And the irony is just intense. And I think what it's made me realize is that what it indeed serves to, I think, illustrate is just the depth and scope of how far back this, this whole issue forces us to go in considering how biblical cosmology has been over centuries been just deviated away from and diverted away from in a, in a very lengthy, arduous way scientistic process and what I think someone so many of us who are Christians and and uh, biblical creationists are realizing through all this is that the whole biblical creationist um, revival if we want to call it that of the 20th century um, has been just very limited in its ability to consider all how far the lies go and so we have all these fantastic teachers such as Kent Hovind and Kent Ham and um, so many others who have invested their lives in um, destroying the, the mythology of Darwinism. But there remains a, a blindness and a, a stubbornness, an actual hardness of heart that we, we see manifesting itself in the sadly arrogant tones in the, in the clip. It pushes a man like this, who of course has himself been mocked for decades by those claiming to stand on the, the foundations of scientific truth when it comes to evolution. And then he turns around and mocks his fellow brothers and sisters because he believes they're failing for lack of knowledge, quote unquote, and making Christianity and apparently Christ himself look, look stupid in the eyes of the world. 
but it, but what is this knowledge that he's speaking of? Where does the knowledge of things like gravity come from? That's taken for granted as undeniable scientific fact. I mean, did we learn about gravitational theory from the Bible? Or did humanity inherit this mathematically derived knowledge from the likes of Isaac Newton, a man who on a certain level espouses a belief in God? But at the same time, we now know he also delved into the studying of the Kabbalah and experimenting within the occult sciences of alchemy. So what is the philosophical framework that both the era of the so-called Enlightenment and the era of 20th century creationism stand upon? Most people within mainline Christianity would assume that it is, of course, a biblical foundation which underwrites the scientific discoveries of Newton's laws, and the same biblical foundation which propels the rejection of Darwinism as being pseudoscientific deception. But this is where the assumptions of modern-day creationism fall short, and where the common thread between these two begins to reveal itself. To put it plainly, the, the commonality here is in fact a form of deism. Even though I'm quite certain that someone like Kittenhoven would adamantly reject being described as a deist of any kind, uh, this is nonetheless what I believe that this whole debate over flat earth and biblical cosmology is, is actually serving to show. Classical deism basically affirms the idea of this often cited uh, divine watchmaker analogy, which as the name suggests implies that God created the universe and set it in motion and then stood back from his creation without any further supernatural interference. This is the kind of deism that marked a lot of America's founding fathers, such as Thomas Jefferson, who not surprisingly rejected an interpretation of the Bible which considered uh, miracles or Jesus' resurrection as literal truths. And so this is what we typically think of when we hear the term deism, but interestingly enough, after now having been re-examining so much of what I previously believed about cosmology and creationism through the, the reconsideration of this original, more quote, primitive conceptions of cosmology, it actually becomes quite easy to, to recognize that <laughs> despite the fact that, that modern biblical creationism both rejects the live evolution and very much does believe in the reality of miracles and the, in the supernatural, uh, there's still a, a pretty staunch belief in the division between the natural and supernatural elements of creation. I mean, basically, creationism is still firmly under the tutelage of the Copernican Revolution and the associated Copernican principle, while being largely blissfully unaware of this fact and the implications that come along with it. The net result of that is that, in our contemporary approach to biblical science, we still assume that everything we can see and observe on the earth or above us in the heavens on a regular basis is, a, is merely a function of the clock-like materialistic world which operates on its own according to the laws which God determined at the beginning and that this world functions independently from God's own hand apart from the specific instances in which he makes an exception and then intervenes through some miraculous act. Thus, anything in the scriptures which does not fit within this philosophical assumption is then filtered out and disregarded by way of just reducing it to a mere theological allegory or poetic prose. Things like Joshua's long day is read to mean that, well, of course God didn't actually stop the sun, as the simple reading of the text implies, because we know from modern science that this is ridiculous. And while I realize that even suggesting the idea that biblical creationists might be guilty of a form of materialism is uh, <laughs> probably offensive to more than a couple people, um, the reality is, is that when you when you juxtapose the idea of, you know, what a lot of people in the Flat Earth, uh, the Biblical Flat Earth movement are, are giving serious uh, consideration to, the, especially when it comes to the ideas of the luminaries and things like the, star, the whole question of the stars and their association with the angels, which is really all over the Bible, and, and if you open up the Book of Enoch, it's just like blatantly in your face. All you have to do is just take that idea and ask yourself if this is something that most creation creation science researchers such as Kent Hovind and others would even would even take seriously. This is what I mean when I'm talking about a quasi-materialism. So you see, when, when someone like Kent Hovind scoffs at the idea that this that the sun moves around a central point on a flat plane and sarcastically asks what it is that keeps the sun moving in a circular path. He's quite openly displaying his own philosophical adherence to the quasi-materialism of leftover deistic thought, which dominates mainstream Christian consensus today. 
he and his, his loyal intern there, they laugh at the, the two alternative theories debated among flat earthers, those being density and electromagnetism. But they, they fail to even conceive of what should be a, a pretty obvious third option to consider. And that is the mind-numbingly simple idea that it is just God himself who sustains and directs all the motions of the luminaries along with everything else in creation. In Colossians chapter 1, as it's speaking about Jesus, it says this, starting in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Hold together. Present tense. And this is what we see really throughout the scriptures. It's, it's God himself who lays the earth's foundation and creates the world out of nothing. But then he continues, and as he commands the wind and the rain, commands individual bolts of lightning, he controls the frost, the dew, he calls forth the constellations. I mean, it just goes on and on. He's, he's so much more than just the grand architect, the divine clockmaker, who occasionally sticks his finger into the natural created order. But rather, the Bible shows us that he has his hands on everything. And not just him, but him and his host of angelic administrators. It is truly just such a different cosmological and theological lens to read the whole Bible through. It really is. I mean, it reveals just how much the conventional concept of biblical literalism really isn't as literal as it believes itself to be because it's constantly being stopped short by the philosophical assumption that even the sun and the moon and the stars are nothing more than materialistic pieces of the whole cosmological machine. It's really just a modified deism. It's a quasi-materialism. This, I believe, is part of the broader deception, and it's a deception which permeates so many levels of society, and uh, even within the broader scope of the evangelical church. And it blinds so many people from considering just how big the deception might actually be. And like so many other lies from the enemy, it ultimately thrives by appealing to our basic fallen weakness of pride. Uh, Kent speaks of the Christian flat earthers being destroyed for lack of knowledge, but what, what knowledge is it he, that he himself is defending? Knowledge of the person of God? Or a perceived knowledge of how the universe as a whole functions in a materialistic sense? I believe we have to also remember what else the Bible says when it reminds us that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. I don't see how mocking and belittling others for exploring the idea of an enclosed cosmology could be construed as building up anyone. The flat earth topic has in fact served to bring many people back to a place of examining the scriptures and putting their faith in the God of the Bible. To mock and deride this fact is to malign the very thing which biblical creation science claims is the motive for its efforts in the first place. 